Arizona straight to the line. There's the snap to Murray. Murray looks left, pumps once, looking, looking. A lot of time. Now he throws, and it's intercepted by the Lions. Picked off down the left sideline. Orlovarier picks up a block at the 30, 25, 20, Amani 10, 5, and he's spun out of bounds right there. I see you, 24. I see you. Welcome to the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast. I am Tim Twentyman, the senior writer for DetroitLions.com. And Taylor Decker, a talented left tackle veteran, is going to join me here uh, in today's episode. We're going to talk Lions offense. We're going to talk offensive line. But first, let's get ready for Pittsburgh a little bit. And there are five things I'm going to be watching for in Pittsburgh. Now, Dan Campbell said this week um, that the starters are going to play, except for Jared Goff, and there's no way Jared convincing him otherwise. We know in Atlanta, um, or for Atlanta, I should say, in Detroit week one, you know, Jared caught wind that the offensive line was going to play. He went to Dan Campbell's office and said, look, if those guys are playing, I want to play. It worked. It is not going to work this week. Dan Campbell told the media that he is not playing and there's nothing he can say. And and look, Jared's had a great camp. Um, he's he's had a terrific week in Indy. Um, and so I think we've seen kind of what we need to see from Jared as a team gets ready for Philadelphia. Most of the starters are going to play, minus the quarterback. Obviously, he's the most important player on this team, so uh, don't want anything to happen to Jared. So um, he's going to get the night off. But, look, the starters are going to play. They're going to play about a half. And so, you know, five things I'm going to be looking for uh, to come, you know, Sunday uh, afternoon, 4.30 start there in Pittsburgh is one, I think the quarterback battle jumps out, obviously. Um, Dan Campbell said that that battle is still neck and neck between David Blau and Tim Boyle. And you look at the three weeks of camp, a couple preseason games, and, and just the number in the preseason games, I mean, David Blau, 34 of 50, 217 yards, one touchdown, one interception, obviously the one costly fumble, um, for a 71.8 passer rating. He's also rushed uh, for 40 yards on, I think it was seven carries, you know, so he's gotten, you know, a little bit of work done with his legs. You look at uh, Tim Boyle, uh, 21 to 31, a little bit more efficient, 210 yards. So the, the the yards are right there. Two touchdowns, one interception, 94.8 passer rating. Um, you know, I thought they both did some really good things last week. Uh, David Blau with with the two minute drill right at the end of the first half and the touchdown pass to Tom Kenny. I thought that was big for him um, to kind of finish off a drive with a touchdown. Um, and then Tim Boyle, um, you know, had two touchdown drives, one to start the second half. <clears throat> had a little stretch there where you know a couple three and outs but then put together that massive 18 play drive over nine minutes uh capitalized with the touchdown I was I thought it was really good um you know game for him I thought he was maybe a little bit better than David Blau but I think like like Dan Campbell said that battle is neck and neck what'll be interesting to me is with uh no Jared Goff you know who takes those first team reps will it be Tim Boyle Dan said he was kind of leaning that way but will they both get a shot with the first team offense I mean to me if I'm coach and this is neck and neck and they're evaluating it what I do is, you know, if Tim Boyle starts, I maybe give him a series or two, and then I put David Blau in with the starters so that you can have kind of equal line, equal wide receivers. Let's see them both. I'm not sure if that's the way it's going to play out, but we'll see how how it goes. But obviously a critical game for both guys um, as they kind of try to battle it out to see who Jer- who is Jared Goff's backup. And I think, too, to maybe even force the hand of, of, of Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell to say, hey, do we need to keep three quarterbacks? Do we only keep two? And so it'll be a really interesting you know, final game in Pittsburgh for those guys. And then, you know, I shift over to the other side of the ball. For me, it's, it's defensive gains. Um, you know, I think the defense in Indianapolis had – two really solid days, and especially the defensive line. I thought those guys really got after it, and that's a good Indianapolis offensive line. That's a good Indy offense, and then they kind of transitioned that right into the game, made some plays. Um, you know, the second e- team unit allowed only 30 rushing yards to to a really strong Indianapolis Colts scheme, and I say scheme because obviously the starters weren't there. We didn't see Jonathan Taylor, so it's obviously different, but that's still the same mentality, the same scheme, the same run-first uh, approach. And I thought those second and third team guys were great. And so I want to see the, the defensive gains, especially with the starters. I look back to that Atlanta game and the one series that Atlanta had against 
the first team defense. It was 12 plays, 82 yards, 67 of those yards were rushing, and the Lions gave up three explosive plays of 10-plus yards. Look, this is a team last year, and we all saw it. They've got to be better against the run, right? They averaged 134.1 yards allowed on the ground. That ranked 28th in the NFL. It's just not good enough, right? It's not. They've got to be better um, on the ground. And defensive line coach Todd Walsh kind of challenged those guys heading into Indy, and I thought they responded. And then they responded to the game. Um, The Lions had a a night practice here Tuesday night, um, and I thought the defense was flying around, making some plays early. So I want to kind of see where if they can just kind of pick up where they've left off over this last week and a half and and make some plays early against a Pittsburgh team that you guys know they want to run the football and they want to use their play action off of that. And so I think it's a great test for those guys. And and can they get after the quarterback a little bit, right? We've talked about it before. The 30 sacks were third fewest in the league. Can they stop the run and, and can they get Pittsburgh quarterbacks off their spot a little bit? A couple things I'll be watching out for. The wide receiver position. I think it's been really interesting how this has played out. I think we can all agree, right? DJ Chark, Josh Reynolds, Amon Ross St. Brown, and Khalif Raymond are on. That's four. Now, the news this week of Jamison Williams going on reserve NFI. What that means, guys, is is the first four games he is out. We're not likely to see him until October. And so now that leaves an extra roster spot to at least begin on the initial 53. And you guys are always going to hear me say initial 53 because we always have to remember that once – the Lions get down to 53. They're number two on the waiver wire. And so we see it year and year. There might be a guy cut from another team um, that that maybe is a little bit of upgrade on on your 52nd, 53rd spot. So you could see some movement there too. So whenever I refer refer to it as the initial 53, that's kind of what I'm talking about. But on that initial 53, you've got four, right? Do you keep five? Do you keep six? Knowing that JMO is going to be back in, in, in probably October, early November, I think it'll be really interesting. And let's just for argument's sake say they're going to keep six for, for, for today's podcast. I think it, it's really between Quintez Cephas, Trinity Benson, and Tom Kennedy. And all Tom Kennedy's done is catch 13 passes for 128 yards and two touchdowns in, in the preseason. He's been really, really good. Um, you know, for me, of those three guys, and, and you know, certainly I think Morris – Maurice Alexander's in the mix as well. Um, He had a terrific job returning kicks, uh, averaged 38 yards per kickoff return in Indy last week. And then you've got Khalil Pimpleton, who, you know, they love his speed. Might be, I think, trending toward the the practice squad type type deal, but you never know with a big game. That's that's why you play the games. That's why you strap it up in the preseason. That kid goes out there and has a big game. Maybe he's in the conversation. But for this, I'm, I'm really thinking about Quintez Cephas, Trinity Benson, who they traded for right before the regular season uh, began last year, and then obviously Tom Kennedy. And of those three, I think, you know, Quintez Cephas gives you something a little bit different than the other guys. Obviously, I think he's a little bit stronger. He's a little bit pro-proven. You know, caught 20 balls for over 300 yards, a couple touchdowns his rookie year. Um, He played in four games last year, caught 15 passes, 200 yards, and a couple touchdowns well before the collarbone injury. So, He's pro-proven, and, and he's a little bit bigger, stronger than the other guys. A little bit run-after catch gives you something. He still has to go out there and prove it because that's what Tom Kennedy's done. Um, and, and Dan Campbell has said they're trying to give Tom Kennedy every opportunity to make this roster. And then there's Trinity Benson, you know, the speedster um, who's got some um, special teams ability too. So, you know, I think really for me it comes down to those three guys for what's going to be two or three spots. And, and really Sunday in Pittsburgh could, could go a long way into deciding you know which to maybe separate separate themselves from the pack so something I'll be watching certainly um, you know fourth for me is is Jeff Okuda you know I think that's been a great story all through camp and and because you really have to root for the young man right if you're a Lions fan I mean you know he plays 10 games his first two years he's got the core muscle injury as a freshman obviously the Achilles injury week one so he goes down and you know you just feel bad for the way that, that, that his first two years have gone for the former number three overall pick. And we have to remember, he is the former number three overall pick. You don't become a, a top three pick without having all those athletic traits, those skill sets, that film that, 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 you know, teams love. And so, you know, I think he's 
put his head down, said all the right things. He's just gone to work. And, you know, between him and Will Harris, who are competing for that job opposite Amani or Uarie, to me, and, and, and just from my evaluation of being at practice every day, being at every preseason game, I think Jeff's a little bit ahead. I think Jeff is trending toward that starter spot. But as we talked to Aaron Glenn, the defensive coordinator this week, he says, look, both guys are going to have a role you know even if one and it's not going to be at that outside spot once they settle on Jeff or Will at that outside spot it's going to be their spot but look you've got dime you've got some other packages and sub packages the teams are in nickel sub packages 70 percent of the time and so you know Aaron was saying look it, it, either Will or Jeff is going to have a role um, but but to me I think it's it, it's really Jeff's spot to lose at this point I thought he was good in Indy I thought there were a couple plays where, where Will Harris you know uh, allowed a couple catches and, and Jeff was just really solid it had that nice tackle on a, a third and ten, a little six-yard gain, and, and put him right down, got off the field. He's just been strong. I think he's been the more consistent of the two. Um, we'll have to see where that falls. You know, when when Dan and Brad sit in a room and, and you know with Aubrey present and Aaron Grant, Glenn and, and and decide that out. But to me, I think it's Jeff Okuda's job to lose. And so again, he's going to get an opportunity to play probably with the starters on Sunday. Let's see how you know he plays opposite Amani in that. First First team defense and what they look out looks look like outside. If Jeff can be the player that the Lions, you know, thought he could be when they took him number three in 2020, just how much better is that secondary? Just how much better is that defense? If he can be that guy opposite Amani or Uari, I think that secondary is much much better. We already know the defensive line is going to be better. That's been proven through camp. That's been proven through the couple preseason games. You added Agent Aiden Hutchinson. Excuse me. You've got Charles Harris back. Austin Bryant's been great. And, and, and guys and gals, I tell you, he's been really, really good. And I think he's trending toward being kind of, you know, a guy who plays, not just a reserve guy when Aid needs a break, but they're going to work him in. He's been that good. And so I think they've made gains up front. If Jeff and that secondary can can kind of, you know, pick up their play a little bit, um, then I think this defense is on to something. And then, you know, the fifth thing I'm always looking at is, is, is kind of those final roster spots, those position battles, right? And I've got five real quick ones for you guys before we get Taylor Decker on here is, is at linebacker. First for me is I think Alex Anzalone, um, Malcolm Rodriguez, Derek Barnes, Julian Aquara, and Chris Board to me are are on. Maybe some argue Chris Board might be on the on on the bubble, but I don't think so. Um, not only because of the contract he signed, but he's a veteran player, good sub package situation. I talked about how often defenses are in sub packages. You need linebackers that can play in coverage and, and, and play those sub packages. To me, he's a guy that can do that. Plus, he's a core special teams guy. So you know that leaves guys like James Houston, Jared Davis, Josh Woods, Anthony Pittman. You've got some guys who are really really good on special teams there. So what's the mix? Maybe a guy doesn't play defense as much like an Anthony Pittman, but he can be a really core special teamer. So that's the interesting decisions when it comes down to the initial 53. It's kind of where is that going to be at linebacker? And then at the top, I think Alex Anzalone is going to have the green dot. I think he's the fact that he sat in Indianapolis last week tells you kind of what the coaching stats staff thinks of him as that number one guy and so where are you go what are you going to do with the will has Malcolm Rodriguez done enough to be your starting will linebacker week one against Philadelphia I thought Derek Barnes has come on you know a little bit stronger the last week or so both in the joint practices the preseason game and the practice Tuesday night here and so you know I think you want to watch Derek Barnes and Malcolm Rodriguez pretty closely on Sunday to kind of see maybe who's got that edge. Malcolm's done everything right. And and look, the Lions have tried not to give that young man a starting position, but he just keeps making plays every single day. And so he's got one more opportunity to do that on Sunday along with Derek Barnes. That will be an interesting one to me. Type the backup tight end spot, I think, is is another one. You know, TJ Hawkinson, obviously the Pro Bowler is is inked in. I think Brock Wright has kind of separated himself as that number two guy. Just in my opinion, maybe the coaches differ, but I think he gives you a little bit of something. And, and he was a guy last year um, that I thought came on strong and really fill, f- filled in nicely for uh, TJ Hawkinson. So, you know, I think it's it's Hawk and Brock. And then now you've got the collection of guys, right? Saying, uh, Shane Zylstra, Devin Funches, James Mitchell, the rookie who got a little slow start because of the knee, not that young man's fault, but kind of started behind the eight ball a little bit. And, and we'll kind of see where he falls into that mix. And then you got Derek Deese Jr. 
to me, um, of that group, I know Devin Funches had the really nice game in Atlanta, but I think Shane Zylstra has been the most consistent of the the the, the, the guys vying for that kind of second, third spot. Um, he's just kind of a playmaker, and, and I, I think he's earned a roster spot. But again, he's got to go out there in Pittsburgh, prove it again, play well, and one of those other guys can maybe take it from him. But if it's me right now, just through my evaluations of, of watching training camp practice and watching the preseason, you know, I think that, that position kind of falls at TJ Hawkinson, Brock Wright, and, and Shane Zylstra. We'll see if I'm right, and we'll see if maybe somebody else can, can fit into that mix. <clears throat> The interior O-line, obviously offensive line is a really, really strong spot. We're going to talk to Taylor Decker just about that and the depth. But I think the the, the one battle for that interior spot, I think is the, you got Evan Brown, right? He's your backup, probably your first guard in if, if that's because just those guys have to be so cross-trained when you're a backup guy. But now – do you have enough room for Tommy Kramer and Logan Stenberg? If you keep ten linemen, you do. Um, you know, thinking that you might keep four tackles too with 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 Skipper um, and Matt Nelson. Those guys have been pretty consistent with the second team at right and left. But do you keep three interior backups? Do you keep just two? I think that'll be one of the interesting roster decisions. And then you know who's ahead between Stenberg and Kramer? Again, they've got one more opportunity uh, to make a final good impression with coaches. Um, the kicker. You know, that's been a battle all through camp. You know, coach said pretty early um, Austin Siebert was ahead. You know, I think they've, they've kind of, you know, come. he's come back a little bit um, right there with Riley Patterson. Um, but, again, Austin Siebert's got the bigger of the legs. And, and I think if it's, you know, here, if it's neck and neck, I think you always want the guy who can come in and give you a 58-yarder and you can feel confident that he can get it there and, and you can win that game. Riley's probably a little more accurate from within 50, especially within 40. But it, it, it's just kind of what what Dave Fipp decides he wants. If he wants the bigger leg, if they're both like this, that'll be an interesting decision. We'll see where that comes down to the wire. And then the last one for me before we get Taylor on is, is the nickel cornerback job. Um, I think we all kind of just assumed that was going to be A.J. Parker's job. He played a lot with the ones to begin camp. But then veteran Mike Hughes has kind of worked his way into into really almost an even split with the ones. I think they're really trying to, to decide that spot between A.J. Parker and Mike Hughes. So that'll be really interesting as well. They're both on the roster. I think it's just who kind of emerges as that nickel guy. And like we talked about earlier, teams are in sub 70. That position in the NFL is so crucial now. Um, I think Mike Hughes gives you a little bit, obviously more experience, a little bit bigger body. I think AJ Parker's a little faster, a little quicker. Um, so, you know, I think they both probably have a role, but it'll be interesting to see who starts. So there's lots of things to, to watch in Pittsburgh. It'll be fun that the starters will be there. I will be there. PJ Clark, my producer, will be there. We will be talking post game about everything that transpires. Um, so that should be a fun one. Uh, make sure you catch the post game. And we'll be right back with Taylor Decker in just a few minutes. Welcome back to the 20 Minute in the Huddle presented by Microsoft. You can watch us on YouTube or listen in wherever you get your favorite podcast. I'm excited about today's guest. I've got Taylor Decker. He is the longest tenured offensive lineman for the Detroit. Does that sound player. a little weird? I think I'm the longest tenured player. You are the tenured yeah. player. And you're not quite the oldest. Michael's got you. Michael Brockers yeah, has got, got you. Me by a little bit. By yeah. a little bit. But is that, I mean, when you hear that, I mean, it, it, has it gone by quick? You know? Yeah. It, I mean, I don't, I don't like feel like i am per se like the old guy yeah but i mean yesterday was my birthday i turned 29 and i'm like man nice. i'm happy birthday i'm about way. to be 30 here <laughs> soon so um yeah it's flown by i mean with how the schedule is in season you're so busy you're always doing things you don't ever really get a chance to look back and see like what the past six seven years have been yeah. so um, it's pretty cool, though. It's pretty cool. When you look back at the last six years, you've obviously been through a couple GMs. You've been through a few head coaches. Um, and, and you're now 29 years old. You're you're the established guy in mm -hmm. that room. Like You're the left tackle on an offensive line that, that Taylor could be really, really special. Yeah. Where's your excitement level going into this season, maybe compared to some others, just because it seems like the, the right pieces are kind of falling into place in the front office yeah. with the coaching staff and everything else. And, and now you've got this line. Is this, is this an exciting time? Definitely. I mean, I think as far as the offensive line is concerned, this has been something that I feel like this organization has been building since my draft class. Yeah. 
like every year, every other year, we're trying to add another piece and another piece to try and take our line to the next level. And then big picture wise, I mean, we've added a lot of talent. Yeah. We've got playmakers on both sides of the ball. We've got guys that are fast, they can fly around. Um, and that's just exciting to see. And I think the big thing, and I've said it to the media probably five times now, but I'll say it again. The, the atmosphere for open communication has been awesome. Mm. It, it allows for you to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with coaches, with players, with you know front office people, and, and it's, you're able to have that open conversation. Um, there's no questions you can't ask, and it builds trust. And that starts in your room with Hank, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Hank's one of the, the few carryovers from the last regime, and, yeah. and you guys just seem to have a ton of respect for him. Any offensive oh, yeah. lineman I talk to is like, Hank is the guy. You yeah. know? And you see some of the stuff on Hard Knocks, and I'm, I'm glad we get to sign to kind of see that side of him because we don't really as media members. But it really does start with Hank, doesn't it? In, Absolutely. In terms of the communication. Yeah, I mean, Hank was one guy, when Dan got hired, I, I actually got to speak with him on the phone, and I, I just asked, I'm like, I know you have to go through your process of, of hiring and you have your list of candidates that you want for certain positions. I was like, can you at least just interview Hank? Because we love him. Yeah. And especially for Frank, they both played, like Hank played center for a long time. Right. And he's been so good, I think, for Frank's growth as a center. Um, and then just, he played the game. So he can demand a lot out of us without, without being a and he's not going to ask anything that he hasn't, one, done himself, or two, been asked to do by somebody else, right? Exactly. And that's the difference. And he's just got such a good way of like establishing our standards and holding us to those standards while keeping the whole group together. Mm -hmm. Like, we're all together. We're a family here. We love each other. Um, and he's just got a really good way of doing that, and, and we love him. He's awesome. It does seem like a pretty special room. I mean, we watch you guys, and you guys mess around with each other, and we got a little bit of, of, of a look in the hard knock stuff. But yeah. you guys generally do. Like, that. that's a room that seems like – people always say it there's tight rooms, but genuinely that seems like a really tight room. I mean, I can't speak to other positions necessarily, but I just know from an offensive line standpoint – even if you just switch out one guy on that offensive line, it kind of changes everything. Yeah. Because you're so used to having those five guys, and you kind of know maybe on this pass play, me and Jonah are on the man side. We know what the slide side's going to be like if the quarterback has to drift or how deep the pocket's going to be if we have some speed rushers. You just kind of know, and you have a feel for how guys fit blocks. And then the communication thing. Like, me and Jonah are at the point now where – we go up there and we have our calls that, that you know you need to make, and we don't even have to make them because we already know what each other's going to do. We already know where we're targeted, yeah. and it's just like a sixth sense thing. And then on top of that, we have our own calls yeah. that are not in the playbook that we have to communicate with one another. Um, and there's just and you, you can't say enough about playing next to a guy day in and day out, getting comfortable with them, and then through doing that, there's trust. Yeah. Now, I'm excited you're on because I've had I have to admit I've had defensive player you're the first offensive player I've had on I think I've had Deshaun Elliott I've had Charles Harris Brockers has been by so I love that we get to talk about offense because Taylor look there is a lot of excitement for this offense and especially the offensive line I mean between you and Jonah who's a pro bowler last year Frank mm -hmm. unfortunately had the four games last year but he was a pro bowler the year before yeah. look Big V was a starting left tackle on a Super Bowl winning team yes. you know and now he's inside and then obviously Penne is just trending this way absolutely um with with how good can you guys be i mean it, it's it's we, we in the media have said you know this could be a top five type offensive line i mean just how good can you guys really be or do you guys um, not view it that way no. Do you look at it in the context of how good this offense is and is that the important thing i mean i've always looked at it, offensive line play number one i look at what can i do to make the to help make my group better and then what can the group do to make the offense better let's make the team better so I think on paper, we can be as good as we want to be. Yeah. You know, it, it's really where do we take this thing? And and the big thing is talent's great and everything, but production reigns king. Like, yeah. we can have all the talent in the world, but we need to be productive. And then on top of that, we've seen it, you know, last year, Frank got injured. I missed time with uh, hand surgery. And we got to be out there together, too. Right. So there's a level of durability and there's a level of talent's great and everything. But is the productivity going to be there when we're out there? Um, a little luck, too, plays a factor. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I think, you know, we can be as good as we want to be. But 
it comes down to going out there and doing it on Sundays. Yeah, you know, from the outside looking in, it, it looks like Jared has kind of picked up right where he ended last year. You know, mm-hmm. obviously when they made the, the switches, Dan started playing calls, and they elevated Ben. Um, you just the numbers kind of took off. You guys started winning football games. Just offensively, you looked really good. Now you've added even more weapons. And, and to me, Jared has just kind of looked really, really sad. He seems to be in a really good place. Do you get that same sense, too? I think he's definitely settled in, and you can especially see it starting in OTAs. He was taking a lot of ownership and trying to, like, I'm doing everything. Mm-hmm. I'm going to know every run check, where to bump the mic tag, if there's a safety down. Like, he's really trying to take ownership of that. And, and that's what you want. You, that's what you want your quarterback to do. He's, he's out there to run the show, and he's confident in the huddle. And, like, we know if we do our job up front, he's going to make plays, and we got a bunch of playmakers to get the ball to. So I think he's really, really settled in um, and, like, coming into his own, like, running the show for our offense. And running the show is Ben Johnson in terms of the entire offensive picture. A yeah. um, little bit of a new scheme. Obviously, he's got some things he in- installed last year, some, some concepts that are kind of just key to him that he has. But they really went back and tailored some of the stuff to what um, Jared does well and, and what other guys did well. Just your sense of where this offense is. You're two weeks from Philly. That's a pretty good defense over there. You guys yeah. look like you're, you're kind of ready to roll. Um, I mean, right now we still got Pittsburgh coming up. Yeah. So, I mean, truthfully, we are – you know, kind of grinding on them right now as of today. Um, do I feel like we have the pieces, like coaching wise and personnel wise, to, to be prepared for Philly? Absolutely. Um, and, and let me go back. Ben is, I mean, he's phenomenal. Yeah. He's brilliant. Like, he's super smart, relates really well to the guys. He's been here, he's been in the organization. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can't say enough about him. So, but yeah, I mean, w- once the season starts, I mean, we're going to have our game plan. And like, th- I think we're going to do. Which I can't say, I, you know, I can't say for certain. That would be we, great for the pod, huh? You, you can tell a game plan. I mean, no, no, no I'm just saying that. from from a from a like a game plan standpoint. I think what we're gonna do is, what do our players do well? Yeah. I mean, I, I can go back to college. That was what we always did in college. It's like it doesn't matter what the defenses do. Obviously, you have to scheme certain plays to maybe bump tags or for pressures. Yeah. But what do we do well, and let's go do that. Yeah, and and that puts the ball in our court. I think. You know, you mentioned the Steelers. I think that let, let's touch on that real quick. You got the Steelers preseason week three. Um, Dan said the starters are going to play. You mm-hmm. know, and you guys are going to play a half. And as as a veteran guy, you've played a lot of football. Where are you at in terms of you know playing guys third preseason week? You know, getting those hits, seeing the offense flow one last time before the regular season versus. Do you sit guys? Maybe you don't want injuries. Just mm-hmm. how much of that contact do you need do, as a veteran player to kind of prepare yourself for the regular season? I think there is a balance between, like, veteran player, you've played a lot, getting ready for the games, getting the contact you need, because you need to feel the contact. Yeah. You need to feel full speed bull rush. You need a full speed beat block. You need to feel that even though you've done it a lot. You know, we've had six months off. So you need to feel that. So it's a delicate balance of reps versus. Let's have these guys feeling good. And that's been different throughout camp. You know, you see certain guys will have a day off here and there based on what their needs are. And they have plans laid out for those guys. Um, And I think what everybody has done a really good job of this training camp is like, this is your plan, and they trust in it. Yeah, I had a plan to start camp, trusted in it, feeling good. Like, we had our plan yesterday for this is what the ones are going to get reps wise. We have our plan for the game. This is what, and we just trust in it. Yeah. And, and, And Dan has said multiple times, he's like, you guys are going to feel great going into Philly. So we trust in it. Boy, we can't go on without talking about the hat, though. Did Frank pay you to wear that hat here? Is this a, a, a free promotion for, this for Grizzly one, Man Outdoors here? This one this. was a free hat. My <laughs> first Grizzly Man hat, I had to pay $30 for. What? Yeah. Frank. Big yikes. Big yikes. Frank. Frank. That wasn't, that wasn't a, a gift to the offensive lineman? These were, but my my original one, my, my OG was not, and I did Venmo request him. I got reimbursed. So okay, yeah, all right, Frank. Okay, that 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 that, that that's good. Yeah. But when when you talk about Frank and and how important is that center position to just how everything flows out from there, how the offense, the protections, how mm-hmm. everything else operates. When you have a Pro Bowl guy, when you have a guy who's considered top three in the league at center, mm-hmm. how much easier does that make that whole operation? I mean, you can't say enough about it. I mean, not only is he one of the best in the league physically, but mentally. I mean, the guy is so smart. He's studying the playbook all the time. Like, he can basically call out where pressures they're going to – um, bring it the line of scrimmage and that just helps everybody you know from the center to the guards to the tackle it flows outward we're good yeah we have this defense id properly we know what's coming and 
for him physically, I mean, a center to be able to move a guy that's maybe 340 and just move him five yards off the ball, not a lot, not a lot of guys can do that. That guy can anchor. He's a freak. <laughs> like he, he really is a freak. So, I mean, I can't say enough about Frank. I mean, he's my best friend, so I, I, I love the guy. I'm a huge fan. Last year, you guys rushed for 1,800 yards. You averaged 4.4 yards per carry. Mm-hmm. You have 12 touchdowns. You guys hadn't done that since Barry Sanders was, was toting the rock back in 1998. When you look at that, and, and you guys didn't even play, as you mentioned, a, mm-hmm. a full a game together as a starting five, yeah, that has to be probably a key component of what Ben wants to do, and then the play action and everything else that comes after it. When, when you look at that aspect of the game, what you guys have up front, and then also what you have in DeAndre Swift, Jamal mm-hmm. Williams, and some of the talent there, how excited are you for that aspect of the game and, and being able to you know kind of pose your will on people because that's what the run game is right especially yeah. as an offensive lineman you're op- you're posing your will on somebody else you're not reacting how excited are you for that to be a really big part of this offense because it seems Ben wants it to be I mean that's gonna be everything you look at you look at playoff teams and they're able to run the ball even if the box is stacked to be able to open up the play action mm-hmm. pass and to be, maybe be able to make them stack the box so then you can maybe drop back and throw and get one-on-one coverage outside so I mean that's huge and then just to touch on Swift I think people have only seen like the tip of the iceberg with this kid. Really, he's incredible. Like his mentality, his ability. Like if he's in space with one guy, it's a touchdown. Like that's what we think. And people think he's that shifty kind of, you know, gonna get around a guy. He'll run you over. If oh, yeah. he was, I think he didn't he win the truck award, or I think there was one week Probably. he won. He ran somebody over and won an award from the ML, two times. I'm hearing from from, yeah. from, the, from the background two times. So I mean, he's he's got the full kind of package here and. As a, as a teammate, as an offensive teammate, do you love the fact that when we were in Indy, we talked to him and he came out and he said, look, really my goal is to run for 1,000 yards and have 1,000 yards receiving. He yeah. said that and put that goal out there. And that's obviously, it's only been like three times in, yeah. in the history of the NFL. But for a young guy in his third year to have that kind of aspirations, do you love that as, as a teammate, as a guy that kind of has to plow the way for him to get the, those kind of goals? Absolutely. You want the guy running behind you to, to think that way mm-hmm. and to believe in himself like that. And if there's any guy on this team that could do something like that, it would be him. Like, we want the ball in 32's hands whenever we can get it in his hands. I mean, and I think with, with Deuce and their coaching him, Deuce is fantastic with yeah. the running backs. And I know him and Swift have, like, a they have a great relationship mm-hmm. where they're able to, like, hey, you need to hit this hole here, or maybe we need to bounce it here. And Swift doesn't take it personally. He takes the coaching because – Deuce is a fantastic running backs coach. So, yeah. I mean, we just have a good blend of, like, relationships mm-hmm. that hopefully pay dividends on Sundays. And you got some guys on the outside. We won't see J-Mo till, you know, October, hopefully, mm-hmm. maybe November. But, you know, with DJ there and, and Josh re-signing, it seems like you've got that vertical threat now to go 100%. along with – you know, a, a Pro Bowl tight end and TJ Hawkinson. You just talked about the excitement of Swift, the offensive line. We talked about it. Just seems like all the elements, Taylor, are kind of falling into place on yeah. offense. I mean, as far as like on the edge with our receivers, you have multiple guys, like you said, that are deep threats. And I think we have multiple guys that you go win your one on one matchup, we're going to throw it up to you. And I think we have I mean, like plenty of guys that can go do that. I'm on Rye, I didn't even mention. Yeah, that. I mean, <laughs> we, we have guys that can do that. I mean, their route running, their ability to just go up and make a play. Mm-hmm. Like we've seen a ton of that in camp, and uh, we've you know we've tried to hit a lot of deep balls early in camp to build that part of our offense yeah. that we may not have had as much in the past. So I mean, it's it's going to be fun. I know you're on a tight schedule. You're getting ready for Sunday's game in Pittsburgh. I want to finish with this. You've had two touchdowns. Yeah. <laughs> so has there been something developing now? Are you in the mix? For, for a play? Is there something thrown in? Has Ben created something that, that you're excited about at all? Can we anticipate a third touchdown? And then do you have the celebration down? Not currently does he, but I've been in his ear, I think, in Indy in one of our walkthroughs or something. I was like, I need one more to be in like the record books here. Three <laughs> touchdowns. So it, would that, that be a record? Dialed. I think it, I could be wrong. I think it might be a, like a lineman record or something yeah. like that. I don't know if it's oh, you've for Detroit. Get that. Or Ben's got to get that in there. So, yeah. I mean, I got a couple more years in me to get you that. So, yeah, I hope so. That'd be fun. You That'd got be... a celebration down? No, oh, I don't. Is uh-uh. it just a, it's just a straight spike for you, right? Offensive linemen and fullbacks are like straight spikes. Right? My first or time got... I threw it in the stands and I got fined for it. So, oh, I won't yeah, do that again. I will not do that one. I won't do that one again. So, uh, once we uh, uh, install the play, maybe I'll come up with something. Awesome. Well, Taylor, it's been great to have you. I'm glad we got to talk some offense here. Good luck on Sunday, and we can't wait for the season to get started. It should be fun, and your offense should be really, really fun to watch. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it.